In the light of the resurrection, the first Christians understood that there was a new king of the nations. They therefore saw their task as announcing this fact to all the world. If someone today had a message that he wanted to get out as widely as possible, he would head for New York or Los Angeles or London. The first believers in Jesus went, with a similar hope, to Rome. In the Roman Forum stands the Arch of Titus, which was built to commemorate the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. You can see on the inside of the arch a depiction of Roman soldiers carrying the menorah from the temple. Those soldiers and those who made the arch probably thought that's the end of the Jewish religion. That's the end of the God of Israel. The supreme irony was that at that very moment, as people like Peter and Paul and their Christian companions came here to Rome, the God of Israel was coming in the person of Jesus to Rome and through Rome to all the world. St. Paul, once he had seen the risen Christ, understood this immediately. And that's why in all of his letters we find this phrase, Jesus Curios, Jesus is the Lord. Now to us that sounds like a rather bland spiritual statement. But in Jesus' time, those were fighting words. Because a watchword of the era was, Kaiser Curios, Caesar is the Lord. Caesar's the one to whom final allegiance is due. The message Paul had to the world was, no, not Caesar. Jesus Curios, Jesus is the Lord. On the slopes of the Capitoline Hill, St. Mark lived. And Mark wrote around the year 70, the first gospel. It was written a few years after Mark's friends, Peter and Paul, had been brutally put to death. And Mark wrote this in the opening line of his gospel. The good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Again, it sounds spiritual enough to us, but those two were fighting words. Euangelion, that's the Greek he used, glad tidings, was a word used to describe an imperial victory. When Caesar won a great battle, he sent messengers ahead with the word euangelion. There's good news about this victory. See what Mark is saying and how subversive it was. The real good news hasn't a thing to do with Caesar. It has to do with someone that Caesar put to death and that God raised from the dead. It has to do with Jesus Christ. And then, just to rub it in, he calls him wios tuteu, the son of God. That was an imperial title. Caesar was the son of God. Mark is saying not Caesar, but rather Christ. And imagine now, he's in the belly of the beast. He's in the heart of the, of the empire that killed his friends. And he says these subversive revolutionary things. In the April of 2005, Pope Benedict XVI was elected. He came out here on the front loggia of St. Peter's. And then gathering around him came all the cardinals who had just elected him. The cameras caught the remarkably pensive expression of Francis Cardinal George of Chicago. When Cardinal George got home, the reporters asked him, what were you thinking of as you were looking out from the loggia of St. Peter's? Here's what he said. He said, I was gazing over toward the Circus Maximus, toward the Palatine Hill, where the Roman emperors once reigned, where they looked down upon the persecution of Christians. And I thought, where are their successors? Where's the successor of Julius Caesar? Where's the successor of Marcus Aurelius? And finally, who cares? But if you want to see the successor of Peter, he's standing right next to me, smiling and waving at the crowd. Jesus Christ is Lord. That means Caesar isn't Lord. That means none of Caesar's descendants are Lord. Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, is the one to whom we owe final allegiance. And so Jesus fulfilled the four tasks of the Messiah. 
He gathered the tribes. He cleansed the temple. He dealt with the enemies of Israel. And now he is reigning as Lord of the nations.